Hello and welcome. This is the World Health Organization from Geneva. It's Monday, 11 October 2021, and it's five o'clock, uh, shortly after five o'clock local time. I welcome you to today's press conference, a virtual press conference, to launch the COP26 special report, the health argument for climate action. Um, and I'm joined here by a round of experts. Um, and that's Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, the Assistant Director General for Universal Health Coverage and Healthier Populations. Dr. Maria Nera, the Director for Environment, Climate Change and Health. Dr. Diamit Campbell-Landrum, the Team Lead for Climate Change and Health at WHO HQ here. And last but not least here on the panel, Howard Kappen, the Chief Executive Officer of the International Council of Nurses. Welcome to all of you. And we have uh, two more specialists on the line in order to answer your questions if you so, you so wish. And that's Dr. Jenny Miller, Executive Director from Global Climate and Health Alliance. And Dr. Ruth Etzel, the Chair of the Strategic Advisory Group on Environmental Health uh, International Pediatric Association. Again, welcome to all of you, and um, we also have a translation into the UN official languages, and with this, happy to start, and we'll give the floor to Dr. Naoko Yamamoto, the Assistant Director General here at WHO. Thank you very much. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you at this press conference to launch WHO COP26 special report, The Health Argument for Climate Action. This report spells out the global health community's prescription for the climate action based on the growing body of research that establishes many and inseparable links between climate and health. The recommendations in the WHO COP26 report are the result of the extensive regional consultations, which took place earlier this year and were hosted by WHO Civil Society Working Group and to adv advance action to climate change and in close partnership with WHO regional of offices and other health partners. Thank you very much for your contribution. I would like to thank the numerous WHO colleagues and the health partners who have contributed extensively to both the consultation and the report. I'm also very happy that the report it is launched at the same time as an open letter signed by over three quarters of the global health workforce calling for the national leaders and the COP26 country dele delegation to step up climate action. COP26 is the first UN Global Climate Summit since the start of the pandemic and with the health domaining the political agenda that uh, there is a clear opportunity for the voices of health professionals around the world to make a difference to the, these negotiations. I hand over to Dr. Maria Nera for the presentation of the key message of the report and I wish you a productive and a successful meeting. So thank you very much indeed, and Maria. Thank you, Christian, is that okay? Thank you, Dr. Nam Yamamoto. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening or good morning, depending where you are. Uh, it is my pleasure to present you today, and let me show you a copy, <laughs> and I'm sure that you can have a look in our website. Uh, it's freshly, freshly announced, uh, the health argument for climate action. You know, in, in, as you well know, in few weeks we will have the COP26 and everybody says that this COP has to be special, especially in the level of ambition uh, and solutions and action and interventions proposed, political courage as well, and exceptional in the, in the speed at which those decisions uh, need to be taken. And this is why the health community broadly, because it's WHO, of course, but behind and, and in partnership with WHO, there are many, many health professionals in the broad sense that decided to join us on this call for putting the health argument really at the center to accelerate the negotiations at COP26 in Glasgow uh, this year. So we all hope that this recovery after COVID-19 could incorporate our health arguments because we are convinced that the health 
health will be the motivation to do much more and to accelerate action on climate change. The good news, the good news is that today we have signing a letter calling on the governments to do more on climate change, to tackle the causes of climate change, and we have 45 million health professionals signing. Let me repeat that because it's, a, 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 I think, an incredible number. We have 45 million health professionals joining us on this call for a COP26 with the health argument at the center and uh, where health will be benefiting for all the action that needs to be taken. The number is growing every day, so it's, it's just 45 million today, but I'm sure it's growing. And of course, one of the signature is the, the one of uh, our Director General, Dr. Tedros. So we are all very happy to, to launch this call today, hoping that this voice of the health professionals, which normally is very credible and it has a lot of responsibility and it carries an important uh, weight for the society, can be here. What is the health argument? Well, the health argument for COP26 for climate action is the following. We know that climate change is affecting our health. That has been clearly demonstrated. Uh, dear Mid, maybe later can elaborate a little bit more on that. But we know very well that climate change is affecting the, the pillars of our health, food, water, uh, the quality of the air, and shelter. So as you can imagine, all of that will represent a major risk for our health. And therefore, we need to invest on adaptation to climate change, change on more resilient healthcare facilities and systems and a more resilient society. But the positive message on the health argument is that whatever you do to tackle the causes of climate change will have enormous benefits for the health of the people. And those benefits for the health of the people will come essentially from the reduction of air pollution for in improving air quality and, and let me put you the figures again on the table. Every minute, and this is a horrible figure that I always hate to, to put on the table, every minute we have 13 deaths caused by exposure to air pollution. The benefits of uh, tackling the causes of climate change could be that if you reduce air pollution, if you reach the recommendations of WHO in terms of levels for particulate matter 2.5, we could reduce by 80% the number of deaths that are occurring every year due to air pollution. Imagine this represents 5.6 million deaths that could be safe, could be protected. Similar for if you do the transformation that is needed in terms of sustainable food systems, the healthy diets that will result will prevent as well 5.1 million deaths every year. Plus, other benefits will come from uh, transport, physical activity, and activities related to finance in our society. So I think all of those arguments are very appealing, are very positive. Our society needs to understand that tackling the causes of climate change represents a public health agenda and a public health big opportunity. Most important, uh, whatever you spend, whatever is the, the, the financial investment on, on tackling the causes of uh, climate change will be outweighed by the benefits. So no excuses. The health argument is very strong, is very positive, and in fact, our report is dedicated to the memory of uh, some people might know, particularly in Europe, the little Ella Kisidebra, who passed away with a terrible uh, asthma uh, attacks for, for several years. And uh, for Ella is now one of those children who suffer a lot from, from air pollution. And we want to make sure that in future, this exposure to air pollution and a more sustainable life can be uh, uh, ensured. So I invite you, all of you to look at the health arguments to use it wherever you live or wherever you work or wherever is, uh, are your opportunities, because those are very powerful, very motivating. There are a lot to gain if we do it right or a lot to lose if not. The health community has been asking for, for a health uh, COP for many years. Maybe this one is the, is the time for having it. 
uh, is the first step. We want a real health COP, and we want to make sure that uh, we will measure the, 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 the actions taken to tackle the causes of climate change by counting the number of lives that we are saving. That will be a fantastic indicator for all of us. Dear Mit, can you remind us the 10 recommendations we are making, the 10 prescriptions that we are making on, on our health argument for climate action, please? Thank you very much, Maria. And it's a pleasure to, to add some, some detail to what Maria, Maria has just outlined. Because as she has said, um, many organizations are, are coming forward with recommendations, calls to action. Uh, we also have a, basically a positive offer of support uh, from the health community to, to act on climate change. And that's why the, the report is the health argument for climate, for climate action, because we think health is such a powerful um, reason to act on climate change. So just quickly to run through those, uh, those 10 recommendations, um, you can group them into three uh, big groups. Uh, the first is, is things that we have to do uh, in order to protect our health from climate change. And the first of these is to be aware that our health is not negotiable. Um, we're going into climate negotiations, we're negotiating many things, um, but the life of a single child, uh, whether, it's to, whether it's loss to air pollution or climate change, is not something that should be, uh, be on the table. So that's one of the key messages. There is a, a, a saying in the climate negotiations, particularly from the most vulnerable countries, of 1.5 to stay alive. That's, uh, we need to uh, stay below 1.5 degrees centigrade warming in order to protect ourselves. We mean it in, in, in health terms. It really is a case of staying alive for, for many people around the world. Uh, the second of them is that we need to protect and restore nature. Um, all health depends on, um, on natural ecosystems. We basically have to end this war on nature if we are to protect our, our health. Just a few days ago, the Human Rights Council um, recognized the right to a safe, uh, clean, and healthy environment, um, and those, the, all of those things are very closely linked, um, that we need to protect uh, the, the environment to protect nature if we are to protect human health. So that's number two. Uh, the third is a healthy recovery from COVID-19. Um, economies around the world continue to, quite rightly, pump in billions, if not trillions of dollars into keeping their economies afloat and resuscitating them after the, the slowdowns that have been forced from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we at WHO have been clear from very early on in COVID-19 that this has to be done in such a way that it protects uh, the environment in order to protect health. And yet we still see that about 80% of those uh, investments, according to the OECD, are either neutral or harmful for the, uh, for the environment. We have to bring that balance more towards a, a greener recovery. And the final one in this set is to make health systems resilient. Um, health systems are the first line of protection of people against these climate risks. We know these climate risks are escalating. They're described in the report. And health systems are receiving very, very little support indeed to absorb this additional risk. So that's the things we have to do. Uh, just quickly on the positive, uh, the positive arguments to elaborate a little bit on what Maria has already said. Um, one of the recommendations is to gain the health benefits of climate action. And as Maria has already said, we know that if we were to comply with the Paris uh, targets, uh, the health gains alone would pay for the cost of mitigation twice over. So we need to value those gains and put them into our, into our plans. Um, we also, uh, the next recommendation is to develop clean energy uh, systems. And Maria has just outlined this as well. It's to save um, a large proportion of those over 7 million deaths a year from, uh, from air pollution. That includes, for example, a rapid transition uh, away from coal and the gradual phase out of other fossil fuels. Um, the next recommendation is to reimagine uh, urban environments. And we're seeing cities around the world, including in, in um, recovery from the COVID pandemic, make it easier to walk and cycle, to look at greener spaces. All of those are good for the climate and good for health. Um, and then uh, finally in this set to promote healthy, sustainable food systems. As Maria has just said, that could save over 5 million uh, lives a year to put that into that metric she has just used. used. That's 10 lives saved per minute um, if we were to implement those, uh, those healthy, sustainable food systems. And the final two, um, one of them relates to finance. Um, one of the big constraints that is often put forward for climate action is that it costs money. Um, in fact, uh, if you take into account the health gains, it saves money. 
Um, IMF recently came out with a report that estimated that we are currently, as the globe, financing the fossil fuel industry uh, to a, the tune of about $5.9 trillion a year. Uh, that's about $11 million a minute. Um, and about half of that is the unpaid health costs of air pollution and, and so on. So we can save that money, get the health gains if we were to put it into, uh, in, into healthier energy systems. And the final one of, of, of these, and again, is, is the positive offer from the health community, is to let health workers speak up on, on climate change. We've just heard the numbers of, of health workers that are, that are um, signing up to this letter to endorse climate action. Um, we're about to hear from the International Council of, uh, of Nurses. Health workers are not only numerous, they're probably the most trusted profession on, on earth. Um, where I come from, the only people that are more trusted than doctors are, in fact, nurses. Um, so I'm pleased to, to hand back and to hand over to, uh, to Howard. Well, thank you very much, um, all of you. And um, what better way to hand over to Howard Captain, the CEO of the International Council of Nurses. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good evening, good morning to you all. Uh, I am a nurse uh, and I'm the CEO of the International Council of Nurses and I talk to nurses around the world uh, every week who tell me about how they see the impact on climate change on the health of people that they care for every single day in their practice. There are 45 million plus healthcare professionals who are witnesses to the health emergency that is unfolding in plain sight. Their voice must be heard and acted on. They see and work with young people struggling and old people struggling with respiratory disorders, caused or exacerbated by poor air quality and pollution. People who can't go out, who are struggling with their tasks of daily living, who are losing function and whose independence is undermined. They support people who are not coping with extreme temperature changes from heat stroke and exhaustion to hypothermia. And many of these people are most vulnerable with underlying conditions such as cardiovascular disease which is made worse. And they see and experience extreme events and disasters like flooding and forest fires, which result in the spread of infectious diseases, including vector-borne diseases, the contamination of food and water that people can't avoid. And they see that the impact is not just on people's physical health, but on their mental health. Depression, anxiety, grief, isolation, symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Climate change is stealing the hopes and dreams of people that people have for the future. Healthcare professionals also see the disproportionate impact on the most vulnerable in our societies, the poor, the marginalized, the displaced. Health justice is an expression of our humanity one to another, as well as being the building stones on which safe and cohesive societies are, are made. And it is for all of these reasons why 45 million healthcare professionals are not prepared to be silent witnesses and proudly support and have signed the joint letter to 197 global leaders and the call now for now being time for climate action. Healthcare professionals also make the case for action because it is good not just for planetary health but is good for our public health. The planet has become the patient and like people we need to focus on prevention. There's a virtuous circle between what we do for the public's and individual's health and for planetary health. And also, as my colleagues have pointed out, healthcare professionals don't think that enough attention has been made to the economic case. The increased severity in health conditions, the frequency, increased frequency of deterioration in people's health, resulting in increased admissions and healthcare interventions. These are all things which have costs on our healthcare system and result in the loss of productivity to our economies. Investment in climate action on health is a best buy, and we need to much more seriously add health into the cost assessments of climate change. 
Healthcare professionals have, of course, been at the forefront of responding to COVID. They've seen up close and often far too personally the impact of a lack of preparedness of our health systems on their health as well as on patients. And it is why they have seen how investing in health rapidly also impacts on our whole way of life. Healthcare professionals have said to me, if you think COVID is bad, when it comes to climate change, you ain't seen nothing yet. It's the grandmother of all health threats. COVID and climate change are compounding each other and they're adding pressures on already weak health systems and staff. And it's why business as usual is not an option. And it's why now we need to truly have health at the centre of all our policies, energy, transport, agriculture, water and food. And the final thought, I think that we are missing a trick, and it's something that my colleagues have alluded to already. Nurses and healthcare professionals live these problems. They walk beside those people most affected. They are the eyes and ears on the ground. That means that they understand the problems, but also what the solutions are and they are trusted by the public. Leaders should stop overlooking them when it comes to policy advice. If you are not including healthcare professionals in your advice, then you are flying blind. Healthcare professionals will have strong representation at COP26 and we call on governments to replicate that in all of their national level policy decision making. Thank you. Thank you all so very much for this uh, overview and actually very inspirational overview and yet very detailed. Um, and we have over 120 people online listening to us and that I think is, is reflected and we have um, live feed as well on social media. So thank you all for this. Um, and we have a number of questions already. For those who are not familiar with our system, please uh, flag um, with your raise your hand button that you want to ask a question, get into the queue. And we'll start with Seth Berenstein from AP. Seth, please unmute yourself. Yes, thank you very much for doing this. Um, in the report, you do make a reference to the uh, um, nature climate change study from earlier this year on heat deaths. Uh, your, your report talks about air pollution deaths, but is there a good number that you prefer to use that the WH uses aside from the generic 100,000 estimate that you've used in the past on deaths directly from climate change, not air pollution, you know, not PM 2.5, uh, which is an indirect issue, but directly from climate change, how many a year? The Nature Climate Change Study talked about 0.58% of all summertime deaths. Does that jibe well with you? Is that a good one to use? So thank you very much sir, for this question. I'm handing for to Dr. Diamit Campbell. Yes, uh, thanks very much for the question. I, I think you referred to one of our earlier numbers for, for current um, overall impacts of climate change, a, a study that was done almost 20 years ago now. We do have a more recent study which uh, estimates um, projected deaths from, from climate change um, for the 2030s of about 250,000 a year. But we recognize that's a really conservative uh, figure. We only looked at a, a very small proportion of the, the ways in which climate change, um, climate change affects health. I would say that we, we don't have a current estimate uh, for the impacts of extreme heat um, on health. Um, I would say that the Nature Climate Change Study is, is, a, is a very credible one. We don't have our own official WHO estimates at the moment. Um, but it's one of the things that has been, become very clear in the past uh, few years is this compounding nature of the climate crisis, so increasing um, e extreme heat, uh, but also combining with other vulnerability factors. So we have urbanizing populations, uh, we have older populations, uh, we have populations living with other predis uh, predisposing conditions. So it has been one of the stories of the past uh, few years to, to consider that 
populations that we thought were relatively immune from climate change, so those living in, in developed countries, are in fact much more vulnerable than we thought, including to, to things like heat stress. So um, I think it's, it's perfectly reasonable to, to quote the Na Nature Climate Change uh, Study, um, even though it's not our own estimate. Dr. Nero. In addition to what Jeremy says and to complement on that question, what we are saying in WHO is that uh, the unhealthy choices that are killing our planet are killing our people as well. That's why we have difficulties. Uh, uh, we did this uh, uh, study that Jeremy was referring to look specifically at the so-called direct uh, mortality linked to uh, climate change, which is very conservative. But we look as well at the fact that the causes, uh, I mean, the combustion of fossil fuel is both uh, responsible for, 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 uh, CO, I mean, for, for the climate change and at the same time responsible for air pollution. There is an overlap of, let's say, 75%. And this is why we are bringing all the time to the table the uh, consequences and the mortality linked to, to uh, air pollution, as well as issues related to unhealthy diets or uh, different patterns of urbanization and changes on, 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 on society, and the basic pillars of our, self, our life, as I was mentioning before. Over. Thank you very much both. Uh, next question goes to Bianca Rottier from Global News Brazil. Bianca, please unmute yourself. Hi, hi everyone. So yeah, my question is related to Brazil. Brazil has the Amazon forest and de deforestation is a big topic we know. Following the, the recommendations today, what should Brazil do? What role could Brazil have in the fight against climate change? And, what impact could Brazilians feel if the authorities don't get the message now? Thanks. Yes, Thank please, you. Nero. Boa tarde. Muito obrigado pela, pela pergunta. Uh, uh, I think the recommendations we are making are global. So we are making recommendations for all governments. And of course, that will include Brazil and uh, a country like Brazil with this incredible forest. But the recommendations are for all governments to look at how as citizens and as government we can stop the destruction of uh, nature, ecosystems, and environments because those are the ones that are providing us the, the, the basic needs for our health. So in the case of Brazil, of course, I will encourage any government to look at uh, how to stop aggressive deforestation because we saw the linkages of those of this deforestation, agricultural practice, which are very aggressive, the use of fertilizers and pesticides as, as things that we can reduce and do on a more strategic way in order to reduce our vulnerability vis-a-vis -vis the nest potential emerging on an infec infectious uh, disease uh, because we saw the linkages that when we, you broke the, the, the barrier between human health and animal health. So that will be a recommendation for Brazil and for all the countries that are listening now. The benefits of this type of policies for our health will be very, very important. The gains for our health will be very important and therefore we need to make sure that we make those good linkages uh, at the political level and we, we are very committed at the COP26. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Nera. Next question goes to Christoph Vogt from AFP. Christoph, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello, thank you for taking my question. Um, I was wondering how confident you are that the same heads of states that are going to be at the COP and have been fighting the COVID pandemic for now uh, nearly two years, uh, where we'll be able to get together and tackle uh, climate change, which in many ways it's much more complicated than a pandemic. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Christoph. And uh, we have another question from uh, Belisa Godinho from W Magazine Portugal, which is going very much the same way. Um, so that is the big question. How do we want to enforce this, Dr. Nera? 
Uh, you know, because of the COVID-19, I think that we are all more sensitized to, to, to tackle the causes of uh, what, uh, what's happened to be in the situation where we are now, what's happened to be so vulnerable to an, an infectious agent as uh, SARS-CoV-2. And I think if we want to reduce that vulnerability, we need to tackle the causes of that vulnerability, and those causes are coming upstream. Uh, how to convince uh, our politicians? I think the citizens, we have a major responsibility now. We are much more uh, sensitized about uh, what's happened after COVID-19, how we need to recover. We want our politicians to be more committed on the actions they are taking. We want them to put in place whatever it takes to reduce our vulnerability for the next crisis, whether the next crisis will be an infectious agent or uh, the climate change that we are already confronting. I, I think the citizens, we can play a role uh, as scientists, as health professionals, as uh, individuals, as uh, journalists, on creating that demand. And that's why we are putting this health argument for everybody to understand what that means. This is about our health, not just about our environment, our planet. This is about my health, the health of my children, the health of my family now, not in a few years from now, now. So if we are able to pass that message in a very simple way, if we commit uh, to, to mobilize the, 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 the society in that sense on all the, the transformations that we need, I think it will be fantastic. Of course, the 45 million uh, professionals, health professionals that we are now supporting us and their voices, as the Ermit was saying, are very, we, they have a credibility. So hopefully by, by putting this uh, very motivating health argument and the positive benefits that we, you can obtain, economic, social, health, uh, and even in terms of jobs created, well, uh, I think there are no excuses for not taking more action and, and really be committed and, and accelerate action on, on, on climate change. Thank you so much. With this, we move to Rachel Ramirez, uh, the CNN climate change writer. Uh, Rachel, please unmute yourself. Hi, can folks hear me? Very well. Okay, sounds good. Um, I wanted to point to a separate study that was released today that uses machine learning to analyze around 100,000 climate studies. So trying to put a number on how many people in the world are already experiencing the impacts of the climate crisis. And, but instead they have discovered there's a disturbing inequality in the world of climate science where twice um, uh, wealthier countries are twice as likely, our climate studies are twice as likely to focus on wealthier countries in Europe and North America than low income countries like those in Africa and the Pacific Islands, and they call it the attribution gap. Um, I was wondering if you can speak more of the tangible actions on how the WHO can enforce or encourage, you know, countries to invest in more scientific research in these areas on health and climate change since they are the front lines of the crisis. Um, and I know that's part of the recommended, recommended actions here. Um, I was wondering if you can elaborate more on that sort of gap. Thank you very much. And we'll start with Dr. Nera again. L let me start and then I'm sure that the Ermit can elaborate on that. Uh, there are many things we can put in place. One, uh, we have launched the air quality guidelines. Obviously, the air quality guidelines are not uh, legally binding. So WHO has not uh, this capacity of, of put a law behind. But the countries can go as far as having a legislation and there are plenty of litigations now around the right to clean air and uh, how to, by doing so, you can protect the health of the people. So advancing a little bit on the legislation will be one way. Second, doing an assessment of, of the vulnerability of the people, as you say, which is very different and particularly affecting the most vulnerable, the, those will be the most affected. And, and doing an assessment in terms of uh, what the, the, this will represent for, for food, uh, I mean, the, the production of food, what will represent in terms of uh, exposure to, to uh, unsustainable practices like in agriculture, for instance and uh, proposing uh, 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 on the, um, all the investments that the governments are putting in place now for the COVID-19 recovery, they need to prove that those investments are going into the right uh, direction and for instance, not using those investments to keep 
giving subsidies to fossil fuels. That will be, again, another very concrete action that as the health community, we can go behind and showing the health benefits that will be obtained if we accelerate this transition to the en uh, clean sources of energy, renewable sources of energy, by uh, reducing the, the mortality associated with that. So those are just uh, some examples, and in, 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 in we can provide many more in terms of uh, sustainable transport in cities and uh, better planning for, for buildings and uh, ef energy efficiency, access to clean fuels at the household level, accelerate that agenda as well. There are plenty of uh, interventions that we, we support uh, strongly and that we will do our best to, to convince governments to, to go and, and enforce it. Uh, dear me, you want to? Just, just again to add a, li a little more on this. Um, the situation you have just described for climate uh, change research is exactly the same for climate change and health uh, research. We'll be releasing a report, um, I think, within the next month or so uh, on the adaptation, the, the gap report, basically, on the, the, the gap in climate and health research. And it describes exactly, as you say, um, the relative neglect of studies on those populations which are most exposed to the health impacts of climate change. It also documents that some of the issues which we should probably be most concerned about um, are hardly researched. So there's quite a lot of research on extreme heat, um, a certain amount on, on infectious disease, not much on mental health, even though we see that coming through as a demand, as, as Howard has, has just described from populations from around, uh, around the world. Very little on, on food systems, even though we know we, we could probably save um, millions of lives a year by more sustainable food systems. Um, there are moves in this direction, so the COP presidency, um, one of the health initiatives under the COP presidency um, is a new uh, initiative on adaptation research uh, with a, a particular focus on health. And one of the, the really important things here is that when we've reviewed this, we see most of the papers are describing the problem, um, and there is not as much research as there should be on looking at the interventions that will make a difference. So that's one of the things, the recommendations we would make is to put uh, research effort behind the effectiveness of interventions and how do we get those health gains that we can see uh, are out there rather than just telling people about the problem. Uh, the final thing I would say on this is in fact the report itself is full of um, case studies and resources as to how to implement this agenda. Uh, we actually had trouble fitting in all of the resources and the case studies that we were getting submitted from partners uh, around the world on this. Um, that would not have been the case five years ago. This is a really active area where partners are stepping forward and actually taking, taking concrete action to protect people's, protect people's health. So I, I would encourage you to look in detail at those case studies. Thank you. Christian, if you allow me, just a one uh, another very concrete intervention that maybe we can mention here is that uh, under the UK presidency, there will be a very interesting initiative on decarbonizing the health system. That's really very exciting because uh, the UK is taking a champion role on this. But uh, as you know, for those countries, uh, developed countries, uh, the, 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 the carbon emissions, if the health system were a country, we will be the country number five in terms of contribution to carbon emissions. So as you can imagine, decarbonizing the health uh, system will be a kind of uh, leading by example, will be a very positive initiative mm -hmm. and uh, will provide uh, our contribution as well as the health uh, community to this important uh, uh, contribution. And the, the health professionals are very motivated about this uh, decarbonizing the health system. And uh, you can join that uh, many countries. We hope that many countries will join this first uh, championship of uh, UK and others will join. Over. Thank you, Dr. Nera. And uh, Howard Cotton, please. Thanks, Christian. I just have a couple of observations on the last two questions about, you know, is this the moment when things really could change? How optimistic or, or not? do we feel? Uh, um, and, and my observations, we, firstly, this is, uh, this, this is unique. It's unprecedented, as far as I'm aware, for healthcare professionals to come together uh, in, this, uh, in this way, in this, to express this solidarity on uh, a single, uh, single issue. But it isn't just healthcare professionals who are coming together. We've seen citizens' movement across the world, which, uh, which, is, which is unique in terms of people mobilizing for action and for change. What have we learned from 
COVID. I think it's, it's, it's shown people in the most powerful of ways how not being prepared for the health impacts can impact on their ability to live their normal lives, their daily, their daily lives. I think people understand the consequences much, much more, not just of the risks of deaths and disability, but the restriction on personal freedoms. And of course, we can't vaccinate against climate change. So it's not an issue that's going to go away. We've had this really significant learning from COVID and this generation of political leaders can't kick it down the road. The legacy is going to stick with this generation as well. Um, that all sounds as though it's giving a, a push in the back to act, whereas I think one of the messages that is coming from healthcare professionals is to pull up the aspiration about what the future could be like. There's a really optimistic future here for, the, for this moment that we find ourselves in. So let's grab that as the legacy and embrace it. Thank you very much, Harold um, Catton. Um, next question goes to Laurent Sierra from the Swiss News Agency. Laurent, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you, uh, Christian, for taking my, my question. Uh, I'd like to come back to the to the very first question with uh, with figures. So you mentioned that 250,000 additional deaths uh, that could uh, that could happen in by 2030. Uh, are you able now to predict what could be the the health effects, direct of indirect or indirect, uh, depending on the different scenarios for global warming? What could be the death with the 1.5 degree scenarios? What could be the death or the investment to to make with the two degree scenarios? And then uh, the current trend is at 2.7. So what could be the effect? Or even if it's worse, what could be the effect? Thank you. A lot of uh, details in here. Diamit, uh, you think you could give it a stab? Yes, I, I think on, on the technical details uh, of that, part of the, the, the challenge that we have is that um, at least for the next 20 or 30 years, uh, we're committed to a certain amount of climate change. What will happen over that period is mainly uh, what has come out of, of the emissions that have, that have happened up until now. So most of what we need to do in the short term is that protection of the um, increase in, in the resilience of, of health systems uh, and putting into place a protective measure. So it's adaptation to climate change. So we would be able to save almost all of those, those lives, those 250,000, if we're able to put into place the, the resilience, the, uh, the protective measures that we're that we describe in the report. But perhaps the more important figure is, is, is the uh, figures of the ones that Maria has been referring to. Um, we know that if, um, if we were to put ourselves on a track for staying within 1.5 degrees uh, centigrade, we would be saving over a million lives uh, a year by the 2050s just from reduced air pollution and probably more than that from sustainable food systems. So in fact, over that longer term, um, it's, it's not so much about saying how many lives would we uh, lose from 1.5 degrees centigrade or, 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 or 2 degrees centigrade. It's how many lives can we save um, by all of the measures that we need to put into place to hit those targets. And those numbers are in fact much bigger and much more certain uh, than the ones about the impacts of climate change. Because I would say that as, a, as somebody who's worked in this uh, for, for quite some time now, the challenge that we have with our, uh, with our models is that if you, for the, the higher end of climate change scenarios, it will do such damage to the, uh, to the environmental uh, systems that sustain our health that in fact it's really difficult to put a prediction on that other than to say we must not go there. It is not negotiable um, to, to, to wreck those, those systems. In fact, we, we shy away from making uh, quantitative predictions there and just make it very clear that we have very big health gains uh, if we, uh, fr from the direct health uh, gains of air pollution, sustainable food systems and so on, if we hit our targets to stay within 1.5 degrees centigrade. Thank you, and I'm looking if uh, colleagues want to add. Just, a, just a maybe, one. Christian, to put it maybe on a more uh, journalistic approach, I think this scenario is, is, is not even to be 
consider. I mean, for us, it's not considered. We need to, to accelerate it. That's why we are presenting the health arguments to take action now. We don't want even to look at what it will be the war and, and how our human health will be affected if we go for a catastrophic scenario that we all know what that means. And of course, health will be the first one to be affected. So not even to be considered that scenario, no way. Yeah, thank you for this clarification. Um, sixth question goes, next question goes to Jenny Le Ravello from DevEx. Jenny, please unmute yourself. Hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, according to the report, less than 0.5% of multilateral climate finance is allocated to health projects. Are you calling for a specific percentage to be allocated for health projects? And can you identify examples of health projects should climate finance invest in. Um, also, often international funding for health and climate is often separate. How do you think this can be more integrated? Thank you so much. Now, this is nearly a question for all of our panelists. Um, well, then we start with Dr. Nera again. Let me start, but uh, well, at the moment, yes. Uh, let, let me put a figure on the table. I mean, 25% of the global burden of diseases is linked to environmental risk factors that could be modifiable. Is 25 the figure that we would like to see uh, now on the climate fin finance to protect the health? Maybe this will be too ambitious, but at least uh, more than what we have now on 0 0.5 and reaching at least a different proportion. What we see now is that everybody recognizes on all of the projects that countries are presenting for obtaining climate finance, everybody recognizes the impact that this will have on, on, on the health of the people and how much we need to start to invest, or, well, we should have started uh, years ago on, on making our health system more resilient and our society more resilient to pro pro uh, protect our health. But uh, this is not coming yet. Everybody mentioned health, but then when it's about allocating the funds, this is not uh, uh, transfer. Maybe because, as you rightly say, that the environmental community and the health community or the climate community are separate. I think, again, by putting this health argument, giving all of those good reasons to invest, and, and again, describing the fact that there are no excuses for investments because What's happened until now is that all of those investments and allocation of funds that have been done, including the subsidies, they never contemplate the health cost, the externalities, how much the health sector is already paying. So in fact, as the Army said, we could uh, 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 outweigh the, the, the cost of, uh, of uh, the inter what we need to do to mitigate climate change by the cost that we are already paying, not only with our health, but with our economies at the country level with the, the health system. So all of those arguments are very much in favor of making this COP26 a real health COP and, 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 and moving quickly and allocating a reasonable amount of funds to the health system to make it more resilient because 0 0.5 is definitely not the one that will allow us to make our health system more resilient, but dear me. Uh, again, just to add uh, a little detail on, on that, that w in, in, indeed, obviously 0.5% is, is, is too low, and it is the case that climate and health uh, funding mechanisms are not well joined up. So that's, that's another thing that we're working on that we're recommending that we work on. But I, I think you also asked, basically, do we have examples of, of effectively what should be done with that money? And I would say that, that health does have a whole series of, if you like, shovel-ready projects that are, that are ready to go, which would be good investment for, uh, for any financier. And I'll, I'll just give one example of that, and that is building uh, health facilities which are both greener and more resilient to, uh, to, to climate risks. So we have examples now from around the world, from rich countries to, uh, to poor countries, of how you can build or retrofit health healthcare facilities so that they're much more resilient when uh, when the next flood or drought or cyclone hits, but they also, for example, make use of renewable energy, um, that they, they have wastewater recycling and they have environmental um, uh, sustainability practices in, in place. Um, and this is a really quite an easy target for investment because it's generally under government control. So we, I would just say that if that money were to be made available, then health has a whole series of, uh, of good investments to, to spend it on. Thank you very much both. Um, 
I, we have a question from BBC, Paulina Bessina, who wrote it down, and it fits right now because of the figures, so I'll read out the question. Um, and then after this, once we answer that one, if just to add, I want to go to Dr. Ruth Etzel, who's the chair of the Strategic Advisory Group on Environmental Health International uh, Pediatric Association, maybe to get a, a, a touch on the pediatric side of, of things to get a different uh, note here. So let me go to BBC first. Um, how many deaths are directly linked to air pollution, ambient and indoors, as of 2021, based on the numbers you have? There are many different scientific research and studies with numbers that vary between six to nine million deaths per year. Is there a more accurate number or estimate that we can rely on with considering the impact of COVID and lockdowns around the world? I think this question comes to me. Uh, yeah, our WHO estimation is seven million premature deaths occurring every year. And the figure uh, gets uh, um, the 4 million, 4.1 of household air pollution and uh, a similar figure for outdoor air pollution, ambient air pollution. Of course, you cannot add to those two numbers because there is a, a duplication part of the indoor air pollution is, is contributing as well to the outdoor air pollution. So our latest estimates are telling us that 7 million premature deaths. There are other figures around that and they include other um, models and the, but at, this, at the end of the day, the figures are very similar and uh, uh, for WHO is 7 million premature deaths every year. Thank you. Thank you, important clarification. Um, now, as uh, announced, let me look at Dr. Ruth Etzel um, for maybe a perspective from her side. Over. Thank you. Um, I, I would bring in an important point that I don't think we've talked about yet, and that is the importance of following the lead of the children. Pediatricians are listening to the children, and it's the children who are sounding the alarm. But many adults are hitting the snooze button. The adults, such as government leaders from hundreds of different countries, are continuing to make decisions with their own self-interest in mind, and usually their own term of office in mind. And the children are demanding that they take the long-term view, because decisions that they make today will affect many generations of children to come. And this is not new. You probably remember that 30 years ago at the Rio Conference on Sustainable Development, Severin Suzuki spoke up, and at that time she was only 12 years old, and she demanded that the leaders of the world take action on the climate crisis. And that was before we even had any visible signs of climate change. But now we've got visible signs, and pediatricians are speaking up because we do prevention. We give immunizations to prevent communicable diseases. And we're speaking up now because we know that the health of the people and the health of the planet are one. We're speaking up because the choices we make today will influence many, many generations to come. And we're speaking up because we think it's far past time to allow our leaders to hit the snooze button once again. The time for action is now. Thank you very much, Dr. Hetzel. Um, we'll go ahead with our questions now, and I have two more, and I think we can fit them maybe into the time frame. Uh, the next one goes to Gabriela Sotomayor from uh, El Proceso. Gabriela, please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, the report states that burning of fossi fossil fuels is killing us. And I will say that uh, burning of fossil fuels is killing many Mexicans already. So the government of Mexico insists in going backwards as the world go forward to cleaner energy. So please, if uh, Dr. Marianeira can say a message to Mexico in Spanish, please. Thank you so much. Hola, Gabriela. Uh, voy a intentar hablar en español. No sé si es mexicano también, pero es un español de España. Espero que os valga también. Sí, el informe insiste mucho sobre la importancia de acelerar la transición a energías limpias, energías renovables, energías que no tengamos que quemar 
para que eh, generen esa energía y además generan una contaminación del aire importante. Hacemos un llamamiento a todos los países y, por supuesto, México también, de que dentro de sus posibilidades, pero siempre pensando en los millones de muertos que están relacionados con esa uh, contaminación del aire, que hagan esa transición lo antes posible, porque el uso de los combustibles fósiles tiene los días contados, nos está literalmente matando, sí, esos combustibles, esa, esa dependencia que tenemos de combustibles fósiles está teniendo efectos devastadores en la salud de las personas y por eso, desde un punto de, salud, de vista de salud pública, tenemos que enfatizar el, 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 la transición lo más rápida posible a combustibles limpios, a energía limpia y renovable y México tiene un sol maravilloso que estoy seguro que sabrá utilizar, entre otras fuentes de energía, lo antes posible. Entendemos también que tiene que haber una transición, pero entendemos que hay muchos beneficios para la salud, para la economía, para la sociedad y, por supuesto, para un desarrollo mucho más saludable de todos los países. Pero sí, los combustibles fósiles nos hacen mucho daño a nuestra salud, tienen un impacto muy negativo. Gracias. Muchas gracias. So, with this, we come to what I see as the last question so far, and the honor is to you, John Seracostas from France 24. Yes, uh, good afternoon there. I was wondering, firstly, if uh, Dr. Campbell could give a few uh, concrete examples of where projects can uh, improve health in, in sub saharan Africa. And secondly, uh, to Dr. Anira, uh, you mentioned uh, governments uh, subsidizing fossil fuels never contemplate the health costs. You've been on this message for quite a few years. What is happening? Who's not listening at the G7 and G20 tables? And is the advocacy not sufficient? Yes, that will leave us a good closing discussion at the end here. But uh, Dr. Campbell, Landon, please first. Yes, I, I think you're right to draw attention to sub-Saharan Africa, uh, along with the small island developing states. Uh, it's one of the areas where we suffer the greatest health impacts of climate change. Um, I would say that I'll just give um, perhaps uh, three examples um, of, of things that can be done and, and are being done. Um, one is uh, within the sort of the environmental determinants of health. Uh, we know that climate change is impacting on, uh, on water supplies, it's making water and sanitation uh, less, um, uh, less reliable, uh, increases in floods and droughts are uh, a risk factor for cholera, uh, and, and yet we've been able to work with um, countries, several countries within sub-Saharan Africa to put into place water safety plans that also take into account of climate risks to basically make it much, give a much greater protection against the the health, health impacts of climate change via water and sanitation. Uh, the second is on transmission of infectious disease. Um, we see, for example, that climate change is increasing um, or improving the conditions for transmission of diseases like dengue and malaria. And yet we know that we have concrete interventions which can offer a great deal of protection against, against those. So we know that malaria interventions, bed nets, treatment, and now potentially the malaria vaccine um, will both drive down the risk of malaria, uh, but also make those, uh, those populations less vulnerable to, to climate change. We're also doing work to use climate information to put into place early warning systems uh, so that uh, populations are be better protected from outbreaks of disease, uh, including associated with climate risks. And then the third is the example I referred to earlier, the, the opportunity to invest in renewing or the revitalizing the health infrastructure of sub-Saharan Africa, which is a rapidly economically developing part of, uh, part of the world. It has higher growth rates than, than most other parts of the world. There is the opportunity to leapfrog from lack of uh, health infrastructure or poor health infrastructure to basically the hospitals and health clinics of the future. And we now have the examples and the evidence to say these are the kinds of things you can do to make your healthcare facility or your hospital both environmentally sustainable and resilient to, to climate risks. And uh, then we have the second part about who's not listening. Um, 
Well, we would like to think that everybody's listening, but maybe they are a little bit slow on the reaction. But uh, I think that the, the scientific evidence behind that is very clear. Of course, it will need a, a, a transition, but we want this transition to be as quick as possible in the name of health. And uh, I think uh, good things are happening now. The, the European Commission, they, they, are, they have a track on looking at uh, the, the, the incoherence maybe between their policies on, on EU Green Deal and the zero pollution and uh, the, the some countries are still uh, giving subsidies and they are trying to align that and, and make a, a very coherent approach. There is this zero pollution strategy at the European Union which we are very keen on, on, on looking at that and making sure that uh, there will be a quick transition, and there are many countries that are now advancing. So I prefer to keep on the positive, uh, John, and, and, and see that some countries are listening and are moving, and for the others, we will keep repeating our message, insisting and in making sure that uh, the health argument is very clear for them to, to, to take action and to be finally convinced of it. I'll ask Dr. Yamamoto also. Thank you very much. And I just would like to add a few words about, especially for the final question. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this is a 10 recommendations. It comes from the uh, broader consultation with the civil society, our global health partner, health professionals, and government as well, and our uh, UN agencies. And if you read the uh, uh, 10 recommendations on climate change and the health, it's it, it, kind of the transformative, or we can translate this each recommendation to action at personal level, community level, as well as regional level, national level, as well as global level. So if you continue to do it, even though it's some area, like a food safety area, clean energy area, or community engagement area, we come up with big voices, and uh, definitely we can change the world. Because as Maria and Diamit and Howard said, we're very positive, but uh, optimistic, but uh, also this is a way we have to go. So we will repeat it. Thank you. Very good repetition. That's indeed necessary. So with this, we've come through our uh, lines of questions. Um, I thank all the journalists very much. But before we're closing, of course, I would like to ask our panelists, and especially also those who haven't spoken yet, to give a few closing remarks. And I'll start with Dr. Jenny Miller, the Executive Director of the Global Climate and Health Alliance. Jenny, please unmute yourself. Yeah, thank you so much. And I think the thing that I would just really like to emphasize is the what the letter, um, the sign-on letter, the healthy prescription letter shows is that this is a call coming from across the health community. Um, the w, our WHO colleagues uh, have talked about the consultation process for the report. Um, that indeed brought in the, the input of the community, health community worldwide. Um, I think the letter really was needed in order to crystallize that this, these recommended recommendations are actually a demand from the health community uh, that this type of action needs to be taken. And so the, the number of health professionals represented has been mentioned a few times before 5 million, which is, again, just to note, again, that's three-fourths of the health professional community in the world, three-fourths of the health professionals of the world. And we have sign-on from health professionals and health workers representing over 100 countries. We have pediatricians and family doctors that have signed on to this, nurses, midwives, public health workers, psychotherapists, respiratory therapists, allied health workers, health students. It really is from across the spectrum of the health community, a call for climate action to protect health because the health community recognizes really what's at stake and wants to see this action taken now. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. And that was basically the lead directly to Howard Catton, the CEO of the International Council of Nurses. Howard. Um, thanks very much. Um, as Jenny has said, I think if I put it even more plainly, the voices from healthcare professionals aren't going away anywhere soon. And combined with the other voices, the mobilization that we're, sat with, that we're seeing, this is, this is a powerful, passionate, and committed uh, group who uh, are going to uh, hold leaders to account and demand change. Because you don't have to think 
for very long about what the consequences are of doing nothing, what that will mean to our lives, our families, and the future generations that are to come. And this is happening on all of our collective watch. Um, can we afford it? Can we afford not to? Uh, is a key is a key question. Final point from me. I just like to so I'd like to just give it this important message around the health financing issue, without at risk of slipping back into a negative um, a negative perspective. But when we talk about financing health systems, we're talking about our healthcare workforce. They're indivisible. Our clinics, our hospitals, without our health workers are just empty buildings. There are some incredibly worrying signs about the, uh, the current state of the global health care workforce, their mental health, their physical health, people who are leaving the profession as well. Uh, we need the investment in our health care workforce. We need to be clear it's not a cost, it's an, in, it's an investment. Uh, and we need to see that mainlined and mainstreamed in health funding in all countries and I would like to see much more public transparency around some of those some of that data and some of those figures as, as well because it doesn't what people might say in this room doesn't always match what we hear from people in countries as 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 well um, and I think that there is it's a terrible analogy to say we need to hold people's feet to the fire given the topic that we're that, that we're that, that, that we're addressing here but Yes, our voice, our support, our mobilisation, our commitment and our passion for this isn't going to wither any time soon. Thank you very much for this. And uh, I'll hand over to Marianera for the closing remarks. Thank you. It's just to say that uh, I invite uh, once again everyone to please have a look at the health argument for climate action. I think it's very powerful, very motivating. Everybody can use it. Look at the, the prescriptions because they are prescriptions, healthy and positive prescriptions. Use it and uh, share with others. And my second uh, concluding remark, Christian, is uh, thank you to every one of the 45 millions behind uh, the, the, this report. So how can you not listen to the 45 millions of health professionals? Come on, listen to them and uh, go with the prescriptions they are making. And I'm sure that our world will be better, greener, healthier, and fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, for the journalists, there's no more embargo on this uh, press briefing or the report now anymore. Um, if you haven't found it already online, the report, uh, or we haven't sent it to you, we'll send the link uh, together with the press release and the uh, audio and sound files of this press briefing shortly after the briefing. With this, I thank you all very much, the panelists uh, remotely and here in the room. Have a good day. <laughs>